Hi, this is Ms. Orender, and I have the privilege of recording your information regarding coordinating care for patients with muscle skeletal trauma. In my nursing history, during my acute care part of my career, I worked on an orthopedic unit in several hospitals, and this is a real passion of mine. And I always like to think of orthopedic patients as not really sick, but more broken. And we as nurses work with a big team to try to put those patients back together and heal them. So although our patients may have those pre-existing conditions, a lot of times they don't come in with those conditions. They come in because of that muscle skeletal issue that's bringing them into the hospital, the acute care setting, where we then provide care as a healthcare team. So just a little something to think about, you know, with a pun on um, skeletal humor is that these patients aren't so much sick as they are broken. Uh, several things I want to go ahead and mention before we get started in this lecture is you always have to remember and encourage patients and their families to ensure adequate foods high in protein and calcium that are going to be needed for bone and tissue healing and that red bone marrow needs uh, weight bearing in order to stimulate those red blood cell production. Um, we also want to encourage foods high in iron, and as patients recover, their provider and we also want to uh, educate the patient about the importance of taking that iron uh, multivitamin uh, with their food so that um, they won't have any uh, nausea or vomiting from that. So just some nutritional facts that go along with muscle skeletal patients. The learning objectives that we're going to cover throughout this recorded lecture are going to be number one, compare and contrast common types of fractures as well as complications of fractures. Two, outline the usual healing process for bone. Three, identify typical clinical manifestations that are seen in patients or clients with fractures. Next, we're going to outline common nursing diagnoses for a patient with a fracture. Number five, discuss the nursing care of a patient with a fracture. Six, discuss the nursing care of a patient in traction. Seven, discuss the nursing management of a patient with a fracture. Eight, outline post-operative care for a patient who has undergone surgical procedures to repair a fracture. Nine, discuss patient education required for various fracture injury treatments. And number 10, identify the common types of sports-related injuries as well as the nursing care and management of those patients. On this slide, I have listed the different types of fractures and we're going to discuss some additional uh, terminology that you might see related to fractures, especially when you're reviewing the x-ray results of your patient's uh, chart. And I am familiar with you all knowing a lot of these different types of fractures, but I do want to go over them again with you. Uh, just a reminder that fractures can result from a direct blow or a crushing force, a sudden twisting motion, or even a severe muscle contraction, especially if a patient has a disease process that already weakens the bone, uh, which would be a pathological fracture. And a type of force that is needed can either be direct or indirect that would cause a fracture. So the first type of fracture that I have listed here on this slide is the avulsion fracture. And that is just a fracture where fragments are being pulled away 
by tendons and ligaments at the point of attachment. And this is the number one sports injury or fracture of the ankle. Uh, so it's very commonly seen. Commuted fracture is where the bone splinters into multiple pieces. A compound fracture or open fracture, the skin integrity is compromised. And any time that there's a compromise of the skin, you also want to provide um, a tetanus vaccine for them. So before we would give a patient any type of vaccine or medication, we would also always find out allergies prior to giving um, that medication or vaccine. A compression fracture, perfect example of this would be the vertebrae of someone maybe who has osteoporosis. So uh, this is just where the bone is crushed. A depression fracture is where the bone is forced inward. So if I were thinking about myself and I was out playing softball and went to catch a ball and missed it and it hit my head, that would cause a depressed fracture. Epiphyseal, that is just where on the bone the fracture is. So this area is at the ends of the bone and it involves the growth plate. Green stick fracture is an incomplete fracture when the cortex of the bone bends on one side and it buckles on another. So the cortex is that thick outer portion of the bone, very commonly seen in children. I'm sure that some of you all have uh, seen this in patients that you've taken care of. An impacted bone is a broken bone where the ends of that bone are forced together. An oblique fracture is a fracture line that is at a 45 degree angle. So there's where we use our geometry in nursing, not only when we're talking about fractures, but obviously how we're positioning the patient's bed is um, the use of geometry. Um, pathologic fracture is spontaneous and it's caused due to a weakened bone, uh, usually due to a disease process. A simple fracture is a closed fracture. With that, sometimes people feel that an open or compound fracture is worse than a simple or closed because of what is seen through assessment. However, you must remember that with a simple or closed, they could be having blood loss and we just cannot see it, so we have to monitor for vitals to determine changes in those vital signs and we're, we're looking for shock, hypovolemic shock for that patient. A spiral fracture is just where twisting force um, causes the fracture to coil around the bone. Some other terminology I want you to be familiar with is a complete fracture. That's where the bone, its entire width of the bone has the fracture across it. An incomplete fracture would then include not the entire width of the bone being included in the fracture. We talked about the epiphyseal fracture. Diaphyseal is just a fracture that happens with the shaft of the bone. If a fracture is considered stable, that main, means that bones maintain that anatomical alignment, whereas an unstable fracture means that the bones move out of the correct anatomical alignment. If a fracture is addressed as transverse. That means the fracture crosses the shaft of the bone at approximately a 90 degree angle. So transverse versus oblique fracture is just talking about the angle of the fracture. Um, a transverse fracture is very common with pat disease. It's usually stable after a reduction.
Um, some other terms that you might hear are extracapsulary and intracapsulary. That just means that the fracture is located inside or outside the joint capsule itself. And fatigue or stress fracture is another example of a type of fracture that you might actually see listed. On page 1178 in your textbook, it does show you some pictures of different types of fractures. And on 1179, I, I like this table, the fact that it actually gives the different type of fracture and then treatment that you might see being performed for that particular type of fracture. Going back to um, a compound fracture, I do want you all to know, and you may be f very familiar with this, is that a compound fracture can be listed as a grade 1, 2, or 3. Grade 1 would be less severe, whereas grade 3 would be most severe. That would include skin, muscle, nerve, and blood vessel, as well as the fracture itself. On this slide, I've pulled several images that I found offline of different types of fractures, and we're going to go through them in the classroom. However, I did want to provide them for you. What's important from a nurse's standpoint is not that you're going to be looking at the x-ray in the chart and determining the type of fracture the patient has, but when you read those radiology reports and they talk about all the terminology that we discussed in the previous slide, you're going to be able to imagine, okay, if it is a transverse fracture, then you have that image of what that bone looks like. So we'll review these in class. On this slide, I wanted to show some of the complications that can occur related to fractures or muscle skeletal trauma. So in our first top left image, this is a picture of a patient who has petechiae, and you can see that purplish reddish rash appearing on the upper torso. In the middle left image, that is a fa fasciotomy where um, they had to slice open the fascia to relieve the pressure uh, related to compartment syndrome. You have bone stimulators down on the bottom left. Avascular necrosis is pictured here in the x-ray image where the black arrow is. You can see the little dark spots and that's a decreased blood flow to the femoral head. And then the bottom right picture on the left, um, the patient's leg is red and swollen. Uh, so this is an image of a patient who has a DVT. Okay, on slide seven, we're going to review over the stages of the healing or bone healing phases. And on page 1185 in your textbook, there is a box that shows five separate stages, initially from the fracture and hematoma formation all the way through the healed fracture. So you can see where it's called stage one through stage five in your current textbook. I have listed them slightly different because I want you to know what goes on during those stages. So um, stage one is anywhere from four, 24 to 72 hours after the injury. And that is where the hematoma is formed around the fracture site. And um, so that's why I've tagged it bone injury. Um, the second phase on your slide is fibro, that fibrocartilage um, callus formation. This is stage two, anywhere from three days to two weeks. This is where that granulation tissue begins and that fibrous cartilage um, callus formation occurs. So again, anywhere between three days and two weeks. Um, the next phase I have listed for you is a bony callus formation. This is where actual 
bone healing occurs and new vascular tissue or that callus begins within two to three weeks up to six weeks. So I want to bring your attention to thinking about when a patient has a fracture and a cast application is made. Usually about six to eight weeks that cast comes off and the reason being is where they are in that phase of bone healing. So here we have actual bony callus formation, not a soft cartilage type callus formation. So that callus is bony, hard, therefore it can support the weight and structure without that cast at around that six week period. Bone remodeling um, is that final phase in your textbook where you have that healed fracture between four and five, but um, stage four we'll go back to is where the callus is gradually reabsorbed and transformed into the bone shape that was present before that takes anywhere up through eight weeks. So three weeks to eight weeks to get this callus formation that's being worked on and transforming that bone back to that final process. And then um, stage five is consolidation and remodeling. And this actually can continue up throughout a year. So when we talk about how long does it take healing to take place in young healthy adults, it can be anywhere from four to six weeks, hence six to eight weeks with a cast. And then if we're talking about our geriatric population greater than 70 years of age, it can be longer so greater than three months to have this healing taken place. So taking you back to an x-ray, you can now see where if they were to x-ray at the fracture and three weeks later, they could determine, oh, we've got some delayed healing going on because they're seeing these particular stages occur on the x-ray. This is a nice little image of the actual stages as things progress. For bone healing. I do want to bring up the fact that for a healthy adult to heal, again it takes anywhere from four to six weeks. If somebody's older it takes greater than um, three months. Also we need to make sure that we're encouraging a calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin um, protein rich diet in order to foster good bone healing. So that vitamin would be vitamin D, um, high protein, uh, calcium and phosphorus, necessary for production of new bone. Listed on this slide are the manifestations or signs and symptoms of a fracture. We'll begin with deformity. Deformity is the abnormal position of a bone secondary to a fracture, or it can also be related to the muscles pulling on the fractured bone. So we see a change in bone alignment, and at times there's also alteration in the length of the extremity. For example, if a patient has a right fractured hip, that extremity will be shortened and externally rotated. Swelling is related to the localized tissue trauma, but it also can be related to uh, bleeding and uh, fluid buildup in, within the tissue. Pain is related to the muscle spasms or direct tissue trauma and can also be nerve pressure or uh, movement of the bone that's causing the pain. Numbness can be related to nerve damage or nerve impairment. Uh, guarding is due to the pain. This is when the patient decreases the range of motion, doesn't want anyone to come close to the extremity that might have the fracture in it, and um, you will see them guarding their body part that has the fracture on it. Uh, crepitus is 
It's kind of like a, a rice crispy sound, a popping, snapping, uh, grating of the bones together. So to decrease crepitus, we want to immobilize that fracture right away so that we don't continue to grade that bone um, together because that's going to cause more damage to the fracture site. Uh, muscle spasms, that's where the muscle contracts near the fracture, causing pain. And ecchymosis or bruising can occur related to blood moving into the subcutaneous tissue. Um, for instance, one time I had a patient that had a fractured hip and um, throughout the care of that patient, I was able to assess that they had bruising from all the way under their axillary region on the side where they had the fracture all the way below the knee. And that was because of bleeding that had gone into the subcutaneous um, tissue. We always wanna assess our patient for hypovolemic shock due to blood loss or associated injuries. Remember that we're going to see a decreased blood pressure and increased pulse um, particularly with patients who have fractures such as a pelvic fracture. Um, those areas are very vascular and bleeding can be hidden because we have that abdominal cavity can, that can hold up to about six liters of fluid. So we always want to assess our patients for hypovolemic shock. Before I begin with our neurovascular assessment that we'll be doing as nurses to our patients with um, muscle skeletal compromise, I want to go over some factors that contribute to bone healing, uh, some positive and negative factors. Uh, positive factors would be um, that the fracture is immobilized very quickly. This is absolutely a key to the management of a fracture is that that fracture is immobilized. Uh, timely correction of the fracture. Um, ice can be placed on the fracture area to reduce swelling and also improve comfort. If the patient has had a history of a good intake of vitamin D and calcium, the patient doesn't have any uh, blood supply issues such as uh, diseases that could cause blood supply issues, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease. Um, there's no infection at the site of the fracture. The patient is younger in age. That is a positive factor, as well as that they've had moderate um, activity level or that they're very active. Those are positive. Uh, some negative factors, on the other hand, are that there was a delay in the correction of the fracture, that there was an open fracture or foreign body, the patient's immune compromised, there's decreased circulation to the area where the fracture is, uh, patients have uh, malnutrition, osteoporosis, or they are older in age. So now let's move on to our neurovascular assessment that we're going to include not only in our initial nursing assessment, but our ongoing focused assessments on our patients. So I've tagged this as remember your P's, pain, pressure, pallor, pulses, paralysis, paresis, paresthesia, and puffiness. They keep adding P's to the list. I can remember when there were five P's now I believe I've got seven on this slide. So we're going to initially assess our patient for uh, pain and we are assessing the location, the level, the nature of the pain um, and uh, frequency. The pressure the patient is going to feel is due to the swelling in the tissue in that compartment and due to that swelling, that pressure is, that patient is going to feel an increased pressure where that injury is. 
Pallor is the skin color we want to um, assess. Pulses, we want to palpate distal to the injury as well as evaluate both sides. If the injury is on the right side, we want to palpate the left extremity as well as the right extremity. So distal and proximal to the injury site. Paralysis, we want to assess for the movement or the ability for movement. Paresis is the sensation where paresthesia is numbness and tingling that the patient may state that they feel. Puffiness is a fancy P for swelling. Um, remember that um, our initial assessment is going to be performed and ongoing focused assessments will occur. Um, when I worked on the orthopedic unit, we did our initial assessment and then our ongoing assessments were every hour times 24 hours, then every four hours thereafter. This is where you would follow the um, guidelines of your facility at how often they required assessments to be done. And then we always use our nursing judgment to make more frequent focused assessments when necessary. It's very important that not only we do our neurovascular assessments, but we also continually look at lab work. We want to look at our hemoglobin and hematocrit for our patient because that's going to give us an indication whether the patient is having bleeding. We want to look for our sedimentation rate that's going to provide us um, data for an inflammatory response as well as our CBC with our white blood count. Um, when we're trying to determine if that patient might be having an infectious process going on. Remember that an x-ray is usually done to confirm a fracture. However, that CAT scan and MRI is going to be more complex as it's related to uh, soft tissue injury. On this slide, I've listed for you several nursing diagnoses that would apply to a patient who has muscle skeletal fracture or trauma. Number one, obviously, would be acute pain that we would be um, assessing for impaired mobility, risk for neurovascular compromise. You'll notice that I've colored this differently because even though it is a risk, um, this is the reason why we do the neuro checks on our patient every hour, every four hours or once a shift, depending upon how long a time since the fracture um, or injury. So this is extremely important to monitor for. Uh, risk for infection is also uh, one of the nursing diagnoses. So going back up to acute pain, um, our outcome for that would be that the patient would state he has adequate pain control less than a 3 out of 10, and how would we accomplish that goal would be to maybe place ice, elevate, medicate with um, medications that are prescribed, as well as also putting on Bucks traction, which is a form of skin traction, if it is ordered. So making sure that that is uh, correctly on the patient and being used. So let's go back to how you'd write this full nursing diagnosis. It would be pain acute related to muscle skeletal injury as evidenced by, and you could place there what the patient stated the pain level was. Um, did you see him grimacing, guarding? Anything that you can collect with your subjective and objective data would go as, your, as manifested by. Your pathophys of the problem is always your related to. Um, impaired mobility, this is a great nursing diagnosis where you're going to pull in um, the whole healthcare team, which would include physical therapy and your physical therapy assistant. So your outcome here maybe would be free of consequences of impaired mobility or ambulating with or without assist device a certain distance by a certain date. 
So let's just say that the patient ambulates with the crutches 30 feet by date of discharge. That could be a goal. Um, some interventions maybe could be medicating that patient prior to therapy, making sure that the patient is attending their therapy sessions, range of motion prior to uh, therapy or at least once a shift, and um, teaching about whatever kind of assist devices that they may have, whether it be crutches, walker, or cane. Again, a quick recap on crutches needs to be two fingertips from the top of the axillary region so that the nerve isn't compressed. There needs to be a nice flex in the elbow, about 30 degrees, and make sure that the crutches are measured for the patient's height. Um, check the tips of the crutches to make sure that they um, do not have any wear or will um, slide or cause a risk for uh, falls for that patient. Uh, risk for neurovascular compromise. Um, this is a big one. So in order for us to say that the patient has adequate blood flow supply to maintain perfusion and function, which could be our goal, we would know that would occur by doing our neurovascular checks um, frequently. So whether it be every hour, every four hours, or at least once a shift um, would be our interventions. Risk for infection. Again, remember that orthopedic injuries have a high risk of infection due to the fact that um, it could be an open injury. The surgical procedures themselves are <clears throat> very um, complex and would pay, put that patient at a higher risk. Um, please remember that if you're doing any kind of dressing changes that you need to have um, a septic technique when doing those dressing changes. I would never want you to contaminate or bring additional um, bacteria into that wound. I'm even really, really funny. You can go in and get a clean pair of gloves. You don't know who's touched that set of gloves before you came into the room and grabbed a set of gloves without washing their hands. You want to monitor vitals every four to six hours. So that's going to, you're going to look at that temperature so that you can see that that patient is not running a temperature. So therefore we can assume that they're free of infection at that time, as well as looking at their lab work for their uh, white count. Another intervention would be whatever antibiotic is prescribed, that it is hung at the appropriate time so that a therapeutic level of that antibiotic can be continuously maintained and decrease that potential risk for infection. Methods of treating a fracture or reducing a fracture are based on the type of fracture, the location, and the extent of the fracture. And the treatment options obviously are going to be made by the provider. On this slide, I've just given you different ways of treating fractures, and we're going to get into these in detail later in the lecture. However, I want to briefly uh, mention them here. Uh, traction is um, a method of reducing a fracture that helps relieve spasms. It aligns and maintains um, immobilization. A closed reduction is when the provider manipulates the bone back into alignment, uh, may be done at the bedside or down in the surgical area with anesthesia. An open reduction is when the patient is taken to surgery and an incision is made and the bone is realigned. If it's internally fixated, that means that the patient goes to surgery and then they fixate that bone or secure that bone with nails, screws, plates, wires, pins, rods, whatever type of fixation device it is in order to um, align that fracture. If the patient is taken to surgery, 
As nursing, we need to evaluate our lab work prior to the surgery and post-operative. That's going to indicate what kind of blood loss the patient has. Remember your normal H&H &H levels, your hemoglobin, 13 to 17 for a male, 12 to 15 for a female. Hematocrit, uh, 40 to 54 for a male and 36 to 46 for a female. If you notice that their labs are uh, low, you need to let the provider know. Um, we're also looking at white counts, normal white counts between 5 and 15,000. And we want to assess for our um, normal values or our values for our um, electrolytes as well. External fixation, this is where pins are inserted into the bone and a fixation device is put in place outside the body. And a cast is just a mold that Im immobilizes the injury until uh, bone healing occurs. I did not place on this slide a bone stimulator. Uh, this is when a electrical current at the fracture site is in place. And usually they use this when the fracture is not healing in the appropriate amount of time that they want it to. And the bone stimulator increases the migration of osteoblasts to the area so that bone healing occurs more rapid. This can be done internally or externally. If it is internally, the bone stimulator can be active 24 hours a day. If the bone stimulator is placed externally, then it's usually activated for several hours a day. We're going to start off by discussing casts and cast application when treating a fracture. So I've placed on this slide that a cast is a rigid device to immobilize injured bones and promote healing. It's applied to immobilize the joint above and below the fracture. The fracture needs to be reduced manually prior to casting the client and put in a neutral position. And fractures need to be stable in order to cast. If they're not stable, then an open reduction internal fixation is performed. It is imperative that the joint above and below the injury is immobilized so the bone is not moved during the healing process. Therefore, it would cause some impairment in that whole phases of healing and then you would get a um, malunion. This slide simply shows the different types of casts that you will see with a patient with a fracture or other muscle skeletal disorders. First, your cylinder cast, which is the most frequently seen cast. This is your patient who's fractured a arm or a leg. So that mold is placed on an upper or lower extremity. Body cast is where a cast is placed on the upper torso or the lower torso. And a hip spica cast is when a cast is placed on the torso as well as one leg or both legs. Um, I have images of these types of casts on my next slide. I've also provided you with a YouTube link that gives you a video of a normal cylinder cast application. I provided you with two images on this slide. The first image on the left is a cylinder cast. This is the type of cast that you will see on patients that have fractured an arm or a leg. A cylinder cast can be a short cast or a long cast. The cylinder cast that you see in this image is a short leg cast. The images on the right, that's your unilateral and bilateral hip spica cast with an abduction bar. <laughs> 
hip spicas are placed on patients who have hip disorders or frequent dislocations. As far as nursing observations and care for a patient with a cast, before the application, you want to make sure that you do your neuro assessments prior to the application, and that includes a very good skin assessment. You assist the provider with assembling essential materials needed for casting. And if the patient is going to undergo surgery, you need to get a baseline assessment and it must be documented prior so that comparisons can be made after surgery. And this is, I'm talking about uh, your neuro uh, checks for your patient. All right, after application of the cast, whether the casting material is plaster pierce or fiberglass, you want to leave the cast open to air while it's drying. A um, fiberglass cast usually takes about one hour to dry, whereas the plaster pierce can take up to 48 hours. You can elevate the extremity on a pillow uh, times 48 hours and do not cover it while the plaster of pierce is drying. Um, while the fiberglass is drying, you also want to leave that cast material open to air. Use the palms of the hands and not the fingers to handle a wet cast because the indentions can cause pressure points. You want to do frequent neuro checks on the patient's extremity. You can place an ice pack over the injury site or if the patient had surgery and came back with a cast application over the surgical site to continue to decrease swelling and help um, alleviate pain. Be sure to instruct the patient that they will feel a sensation of warmth when the fiberglass cast is drying and that's due to a chemical reaction and that's normal and will be felt by the patient. You can use a hair dryer on low, cool setting to help dry the fiberglass cast. No objects or products should be placed down the cast, so no powders, um, no back scratchers, forks, sticks, anything to try to scratch because the skin will dry and become itchy. And by putting things down into the cast to scratch that dry skin, it would risk having skin integrity and therefore causing infection to occur. You wanna report any increase in pain, foul odor, warmth, or drainage, or changes in the neurological assessments, or neurovascular assessments, excuse me, to the provider. Ensure that the patient knows how to use ambulation devices such as crutches. You wanna ambulate the patient as soon as the provider allows and make sure to follow the weight-bearing uh, status orders. Whether it's non-weight-bearing, which means the patient will not put any weight, weight at all on that extremity, uh, toe touch, partial weight-bearing, or if the patient can have full weight-bearing on that extremity. Make sure you follow those orders specifically and note that documentation in your nurse's notes. You can place tape or what we call pedal the edges of the cast if there's any rough edges or the casting material is causing uh, rubbing or skin irritation. And if the patient comes back from surgery with a cast on, Make sure to mark any drainage on the cast, just like you would if the patient were to come back with the dressing. If casting doesn't allow for your pulse checks, you can observe all other uh, neurovascular checks. Those assessments would still provide adequate information. So when the patient comes back from surgery with a cast, um, most likely the provider will have cut a window in the cast material, which is just a little square, and that square is then placed 
in place in the cast and either wrapped with an ace wrap to keep that window in place or a piece of adhesive is placed over the window. Then you can just take the adhesive off and look at the surgical side underneath and then you replace the window with the adhesive or with the ace wrap. Um, there's a couple other things um, that you might see with a patient coming back from surgery that already has a cast. Um, that cast might have one cut down the cast that's called a univalve that just gives it a little bit more space um, in case there's any swelling. Uh, you also might see a cast that is bivalved. It's almost like a shell with the two parts of the cast that are cut on both sides and then an ace wrap that is wrapping the casting material. So kind of like a hard splint almost. When a cast is removed, a cast saw is used. However, the saw does not circulate like a circular saw. It vibrates and it will produce heat. Um, you should only be cutting through the casting material and you should use bandage scissors to cut through to uh, the stockinette and um, the cotton applications. You should never press the cast saw all the way through all of that material and touch the patient's skin with that cast saw. It won't cut the patient's skin, but it does produce that heat, so the patient can receive a burn uh, from the cast saw. This slide just shows the two different types of casting material that is available. The top picture is plaster Paris and the bottom is fiberglass. So going back to Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War, she would have seen plaster Paris being used, came out in the 1800s, where fiberglass is more recent back in the 70s. Fiberglass is used more often because it is lighter weight and it dries much more quicker, but the provider will determine which type of cast they want applied based on the fracture, the patient, and um, other circumstances. So the basic concept of a cast is prior to application, uh, the patient's extremity is placed in a neutral position, so then they won't have any difficulty with range of motion afterwards, such as foot drop, and stockinette and a cotton cushion wrap is applied. Then the casting material is applied from distal to proximal, molding to the normal contour of the extremity. The cast has to be dry before pressure is applied. When you're dealing with fiberglass, it's about one hour, where plaster of Paris can take up to 48 hours. Again, the type of cast is determined by location of the fracture and the patient's um, health. Mobility is also taken into account. So um, let's go over a couple things regarding um, casting. Um, so once an application is started, the patient needs to be aware that there's going to be a chemical uh, reaction so they are going to feel with fiberglass when it is activated they're going to feel warmth or heat in that material and that is normal. If they're using plaster of Paris well and fiberglass the cast needs to be open to air you want to elevate the extremity usually on a pillow um, but keep the cast material open to air until dry. Um, if the cast gets wet or you want to kind of help with the drying process, you can use a hair dryer on low warm um, to help with that. Otherwise, nothing goes in the cast. No talcum powder, no back scratchers, no coat hangers, no, nothing goes into the cast. 
um, because they can impair their skin and then infection can start and that infection can progress without being noticed. Let's talk about uh, windows and bivalvular cast. So a patient who has surgery actually can come back with a cast and where the surgery, surgery took place, they will cut a window out of the casting material and you'll see either an ACE wrap or a piece of adhesive over the window. That way you can open up the window and um, observe the surgical site. Um, when a patient has surgery, just like you would monitor for drainage and, and what the surgical site looks like, you need to do that with this cast. The drainage then will, you want to mark the cast just like you would a dressing and alert the healthcare provider if any increase in the amount of drainage or um, changes to your assessment of the actual um, surgical site. Now let's talk about if a cast is too tight. Um, that goes back to compartment syndrome. We don't want that to happen. So if the patient starts complaining of increased pressure because they are going to have a swelling, that cast can be either univalved or bivalved. That's with a um, cast saw. And if you have not seen or used a cast saw before, this is not like a circular saw out in your workshop. Uh, this blade vibrates, so it actually cannot cut the patient. Plus, when you are univalvin, bivalvin, taking off a cast, you should never cut through the actual cotton wrap and the stocking net. That's what bandage scissors are for. The only thing that I'm doing with that cast saw is cutting through the casting material. But the patient does need to know that to feel warmth and heat from the appliance when the cast is either being univalved, which is one cut in the cast, and then you would use your spreaders to give a little bit more room for swelling. Or bivalving is two cuts in the cast on both sides, and it becomes more like a splint that is then wrapped with ace wrap. Next, traction is another way that a fraction can, uh, fracture can be reduced. Uh, traction is the application of a straightening or pulling force to return or maintain the fracture in normal anatomical position. And I've listed here for you two different types of traction. It's skin traction, so the device actually wraps around the skin and then the pulling force is placed on that um, appliance and traction is applied. Skin or skeletal, on the other hand, there are pins that go into the bone and then that traction or that pulling force is then placed on that skeletal traction so that um, alignment can be maintained. So the difference is the skin, there's no break in the skin integrity in skeletal uh, pins are placed down into the bone. So, skin traction applies a pulling force um, through the client's skin and it's non-invasive and it's relatively comfortable for the patient. As I alluded to earlier, uh, simple skin traction is a Bucks traction. It's an egg crate booty that is placed on the patient and a usually a five pound weight of traction is applied and this actually applies that pulling force and it decreases the muscle spasms and relieves their pain until they have surgery for a broken hip. Uh, skeletal traction, that's a pulling force that is applied directly through pins inserted into the bone and allows the use of the weight to maintain uh, bone alignment. There is that risk of infection and may cause more discomfort than the actual skin traction.
Uh, any patient who is in traction has a risk for constipation, so you want to make sure. Fiber and fluids. Uh, fluids, we want to increase anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 um, mLs. And um, immobilization with traction can also cause calcium to leak out of the bone. So you need to assess for um, the osteoporosis that can occur that is specific to that area and watch your electrolyte levels. This slide I've just given you several images of different types of traction. So you've heard me mention Buck's traction several times. That is the image in the top left. Usually it's about five pounds of traction that is applied as the pulling force. You can see that um, they have the rope attached to the actual um, device that is just an egg crate booty that wraps around the lower extremity. <clears throat> so Buck's traction is skin. Russell's traction, which is the bottom left image, that is also skin. Don't be confused when they have all these different appliances and sl slings and wraps. Do they have pins? Then it's skeletal. If not, it is skin. So here it's just the sling is given the additional support, the ace wrap, and the traction is then applied and pulling force. You can see where it would go um, to the end of the bed. And top right is a balanced skeletal traction. So uh, where at the base of the femur is where the pin site is. Um, this has a, a Thomas splint with a Pearson attachment to it. And then the bottom right is called gallows traction. And this again is a skin traction um, with, the, with the wraps. And that is for hip dysplasia for um, children. This is an image of a typical patient in skeletal traction. And what I wanna do with you on this image is take you through the different parts of the traction and the setup of traction. This image came off of a website called freenursetutor.com and I do not believe that is functioning anymore, but I did wanna share with you that I got this image from that website. So let's begin with the actual traction itself. So the traction itself you'll see weights in this image. There are four different sets of weights. That is the actual traction. So if somebody states your patient has five pounds of traction, it's the weight or the sandbag that's attached to the actual um, rope that is supplying that pulling force. So traction again is suspended weights that provide a pull to put the extremity in alignment. And these weights must hang freely. They cannot touch the end of the bed, the head of the bed, the floor of the hospital room. And you're not going to drape sheets or blankets over those ropes that are attached to the weights. Everything needs to be freely hanging. So if I were to have to go in as a nurse and pull my patient up in bed, then I have to have someone else come with me so that when moving the patient, those weights can still freely hang and not hit the end of the bed or drop onto the ground. So always bring assistance in with you when you go in to reposition the patient by pulling them up in bed because you wanna maintain that traction. Okay, next we'll go to the trapeze bar and you'll see that in the center of this image. It looks like a little triangle. Um, this is a uh, bar that helps the patient with mobility and it keeps them kind of independent, provides some activity, um, 
for the patient so that they can use to pull up their upper, upper body when they need to. Okay, next is the actual pin site itself. So in this image, the pin sites are located at the base of the femur, and it's actually where the pin is inserted into the bone and it provides attachment for the wires. This pin actually goes into the bone, so therefore it increases the risk of infection, causing the need for special care called pin care. Okay, next are pulleys, and pulleys are the circular silver items that you see in this image. And pulleys are where the wires and ropes slide through, and they must be kept free moving. And then wires and ropes, they support the weights, and they must also run freely through the pulleys without any obstruction. And you want to keep the blankets, the sheets, anything off of those wires and ropes. And then last, you see the patient themselves that is lying in the bed with the head of the bed elevated. Um, this is called counter traction. The body opposes that pulling force of the weight and that provides a counter traction. What's very important with a patient in traction is that anytime you provide care for the patient, when you're positioning the patient or moving them up in bed, you always need to go to the foot of the bed and make sure that that patient is in alignment in the center of the bed. And that that counter traction is occurring because if not, the patient's just gonna get pulled to the bottom of the bed, okay? Um, another thing about traction is Instead of making the bed from one side to the other as we normally provide a bed change, linen change for a patient, someone who is in traction, we actually would make the bed from head to toe. Um, and then the patient can use the trapeze bar to assist in that linen change. Nursing interventions related to traction <clears throat> Again, um, you want to maintain that pulling force with the traction. So traction would never, skeletal traction would never be removed. So I'd never take the weights off to do something with the patient and then put weights back on. That totally um, defeats the whole purpose of skeletal traction. That being said, the provider is the only one that's going to do anything with um, move, removing weights and making changes there. Our role is to make sure that that skeletal traction is in place and effective. We're going to do neuro checks, so that's going to be to the skin and to the pin site insertion. So um, with a patient with traction, we want to make sure that they stay in the center of the bed, maintain body alignment with the direction of the pool. Nothing is lying on or obstructing the ropes that the knots are taped and the knots should not come in contact with the pulleys. Uh, weights hang freely and don't touch the floor. When we're looking at skin, we want to check pulses, color, sensation, movement, distal to the wrapping. Uh, only remove weights intermittently if, if, if it has been ordered and to rewrap in Resecure bandages. Frequently assess the skin, bony prominences, and pressure points for irritation and breakdown. And we want to protect the pressure sites with protective dressings. Again, uh, pin care is ordered. You want to follow the policy and procedure of the facility uh, where you are. We want to report any signs and symptoms of infection and report any complications of immobility. Um, I've already talked about making the bed from head to toe because they can use the trapeze to lift themselves up and help move um, when you're replacing the linens underneath uh, the patient. As far as pin care goes, you want to assess the site for redness, swelling, drainage. You want to look at the pins. Are they straight? Are they bending? Uh, 
um, you want to teach the patient not to touch the pins because it's normal to have the dry uh, Sears drainage, so that yellow uh, crusty drainage all around the pin sites, that's normal. They have a tendency to want to pick at that. Um, teach them not to touch the pins. Always um, when you're doing pin care, you want to start at the pin site and go outward. Never draw back into the pin site because we don't want to bring back bacteria into um, the site of the pin because that pin is going directly into the bone and we would not want to lead to osteomyelitis. Um, if the order calls for ointment, then uh, a triple antibiotic ointment could be used, but normally it is just to clean the site. Um, if it is a saline hydrogen peroxide mixture, make sure that you follow up with the um, saline because that hydrogen peroxide can be irritating to the skin if left in place. Now, uh, this is a soapbox. Uh, some facilities, or I even think some of the textbooks say that you can clean the site. At, it's a clean technique. However, I always perform it as a sterile technique because, again, I don't know whose hands have been in the gloves when they walk in the door. And um, I also use that sterile Q-tip and start from the pen site and rotate out, never bringing back my Q-tip um, to the actual pen again after I've rotated out. One applicator per pen meant because then I can document uh, what I've done and I am secure that I have not um, increased that risk for osteomyelitis. Okay, in your Hoffman textbook on pages um, 1183 and 84, it gives a good review on assessment, vitals, labs, actions, and teaching. So I do want you to review those. Um, I believe I've already stressed the importance of assessments and all your P's. You're going to do vitals to um, determine for shock, for infection. You want to monitor labs for um, infection or blood loss. And then as far as actions, we're going to administer those pain medication as ordered, antibiotics as ordered, and then anticoagulants as ordered. If the patient is on um, Lovenox, we want to rotate the sites around the abdomen. And if they're on Coumadin, then that we're going to have to monitor our PTINR to make sure that the that level is in therapeutic range and then that patient is also have to be taught on um, vitamin K um, rich foods because that is going to impair the um, action of Coumadin. So foods that are um, nice and healthy for you like leafy green vegetables you have to limit usually a half a cup um, is the size of serving that you would want the patient to take in of those leafy green uh, vegetables. Also, uh, when they're on Coumadin, you want to um, encourage them not to uh, take in uh, large amounts of alcohol, especially when you're looking at alcohol. Um, harder liquors have a tendency to affect the PTINR numbers more so than like beer. But you don't want them to uh, go out and binge anything as far as drinking goes because that will affect their PTINR. Antibiotics will also um, adjust their PTINR so you will have to make adjustments to the anticoagulant dosage based on the fact that they have other meds that they need to take. Ice can always be applied um, to a cast and um, that's going to help decrease uh, swelling and pain. Range of motion exercises um, are going to be important especially on the um, what, what you can do range of motion on and to um, keep 
functioning going on all the other extremities because they're going to have to use those assist devices later. Uh, pulmonary hygiene, your book does talk about. It's important for incentive spirometry, uh, coughing and deep breathing every hour. The IS is um, 10 times an hour while awake. Um, I love it when I go into a room and the sinus barometer is there and I ask a patient um, to show me um, how to use it and they say they don't know that somebody just came in and put it down and told them they needed to use it. So it's very important that we teach our patient the proper way to use an incentive barometer and I always say, you know, it's like uh, you're sucking on a straw or if they're a smoker it's like they're smoking a cigarette you take a nice slow deep breath in and it's not about getting that um, ball or level all the way to the top it's maintaining in between the ranges that have been uh, the window that's been set and you may have a range of only 500 for an incentive barometer but that they're taking that nice, slow, deep breath in so that they don't get atelectasis, which leads to pneumonia. Um, nutrition, we've talked about. Your book talks about, again, the importance of protein, calcium, vitamin D, and uh, for repair. And we want to increase our fluid intake because of um, renal calculi that might occur. We discussed that when we were talking about rhabdomyelitis. Um, I think that's all I want to talk about on this slide, but make sure you go to your textbook and review this information. I have listed for you common post-operative care for orthopedic client. I'm going to start with vital signs. Those are your standard um, post-op vitals every 15 minutes times one hour, every 30 minutes times two hourly, and then every four hours and progress from there. Um, neuro checks we've already um, discussed to be every hour and then every four hours. We want to assess for incisional bleeding and marking that drainage look at the wound, what does the drainage look like, it is serous, serous sanguinous, sanguinous drainage. Um, reposition every two hours is going to be important. Incentive spirometer every hour while awake, ten times. We're going to cough and deep breathe. We want to provide comfort by medicating the patient with um, analgesics. As soon as possible we want to get this patient up out of bed and ambulating. Um, that is going to benefit them in the long run. They're not going to like you at first, but you're doing it in their best interest. Uh, physical therapy will usually be uh, consulted if they have surgery in the morning, they're usually in in the afternoon, getting the patient up for the first time into the chair, and then helping them get back into uh, bed. Depending upon how the patient does postoperatively, then uh, therapy may continue to work with that patient, but then nursing also steps in to do um, mobility with that patient from then on out. But that would be important to assess um, nursing or the doctor's orders first plus physical therapy um, notes. Um, if the patient surgery was performed later in the day, you'll see them coming in first thing in the morning to get them um, to the chair or begin ambulation. SCD, sequential compression devices, um, are used in conjunction with TED hose. A continuous passive motion machine, this is a, a machine that is placed in during surgery and uh, recovery. The degree of flexion, this is for somebody who has like a total knee. Some providers may use it. Again, it depends on the provider if they choose to use it or not. So you may or may not see a CPM being used. Um, but normally with a total knee, they'll come back from um, PACU with the CPM. The degree of flexion has been set by the provider, the surgeon. And while this patient is in bed, that CPM, if they are choosing to use it, should be on. So that it's continuously flexing that extremity. Um, the whole purpose of a CPM is to decrease the amount of scar tissue so that healing can take place. Um, 
SCDs, again, have to be on while the patient is in bed and best used if with TED hose and SCDs. Um, diet, we've already talked about, rich in calcium, protein, vitamin D, and we want to have plenty of fiber and fluids. Uh, Post-operative teaching, depending upon the type of surgery they have with the orthopedic condition, if it's an ORIF, that just means it's an open reduction internal fixation. So let's say, for an example, I fell and broke my hip. I tripped over a rug and um, I broke my hip. Now, depending upon where the fracture is, they may just need to do an ORIF, put a plate and some screws and wires in, and the repair is done. Now, if it's closer to the neck of the femur near the head, they may choose to do a partial hip replacement versus a total hip replacement where you would have the ball and the socket replaced. If it's a partial or hemi, it would be just the head portion of the femur is replaced. So again, it depends on what the fracture is and um, the provider gets in and determine what needs to be done. But those are multiple different types of surgery um, as far as a, a reduction internal fixation, all right, or total or partial joint replacement. Um, Post-op teaching, again, particularly for somebody who has a total hip, the degree of flexion is very important. They should never go beyond 90 degrees because they're at risk for dislocating the um, joint. So they're going to have to have elevated toilet seats. Their nice cushy recliner at home needs to be uh, switched out for a higher chair that is firmer. Um, their seat in their car needs to be, you know, brought up higher so that that flexion does not occur. They never want to cross their um, feet because that then rotates that ball out and will increase their risk for a dislocation. So that is why an pillow is used or a regular pillow if they are alert and oriented and just need a reminder. Um, to keep those legs abducted so that that ball sits nice down deep in the socket um, and gives time for um, the mole and soft tissue to heal from the surgery. All right, moving away from fractures, we're going to talk about some sports-related injuries moving forward, as well as carpal tunnel. Um, so on this slide, we have some information about a dislocation versus a sprain strain. You need to know the difference between a sprain strain, which you may be from very familiar with. So a dislocation is where uh, the surfaces of the joint are no longer in contact, and when a patient um, has a dislocation they may actually feel a pop or a giving away so the structural shape is altered so um, that joint will look different um, normally after surgery that joint should not look different you're going to have swelling but the actual um, appearance of the joint will not change um, they will have pain if it like is a d dislocated uh, hip, that extremity will be shorter than its unaffected extremity, and obviously length, range of motion is limited. They're going to determine a dislocation by x-ray. We want to give them analgesics, immobilize, place ice on, do neurochecks, and the physician will manipulate uh, to reduce the dislocation. A sprain, and then um, I do want to go over the difference between a sprain and a strain, but I also want you to be aware um, that there are levels or degrees of sprain strains. So first, second, third degree, obviously a third deg degree sprain or strain would be more um, severe and actually can have a longer recovery time than an actual fracture.
So keep that in mind when you're dealing with fractures and you also have soft tissue injury on top of the fracture. So um, I have had a sprain strain to myself occur and I've actually been casted for that because of the severity. So a sprain is a stretching or tear in one or more ligaments surrounding the joint. Again, loss of function, they're gonna feel a pop, discoloration because of the bruising, rapid swelling, pain, and again, grades one through three or uh, levels, first, second, third degree. Um, rice, so rest, ice, compress, elevate, and you add another E on the end because we're gonna evaluate. Um, they determine a sprain strain, They'll do an x-ray initially to see if there's a fracture, but an MRI will be uh, more helpful because that looks at soft tissue injury. NSAIDs are a very important part of the treatment for a sprain strain. And again, upon the severity, it can take up to 12 months to heal. And if it's severe, casting can be done. So if a sprain is a stretching or tearing of ligaments, then a strain actually is um, an injury to the muscle or um, tendon. So you can have those two uh, simultaneously. I want to start this slide by thanking you for watching the YouTube video that I have here on the slide for you to watch. It gives a great review on the 2.3.4 point as well as how a patient is to ambulate up and down stairs with crutches as well as sitting down. So just as a quick overview, remember when you as a nurse are assessing your patient and their ability to use crutches, you know, let's say you're in an office setting working, uh, you may not have a physical therapist that does this and you as the nurse will be asked to measure crutches and make sure that the patient is educated on the use of those crutches. So you always want to evaluate whether your patient has good muscle strength and understands the education that you're providing regarding crutch walking. You want to um, assess the rubber tips of the crutches, the placement of the hand grip, as well as the arm pad. That arm pad underneath the axillary region should be approximately one to one and a half inches or about two to three fingertips distance below the axillary region and that is so that the patient doesn't put direct pressure from that arm pad on the, bra the brachial plexus nerve causing nerve damage. There should be a nice uh, flexion about a 30 degree flexion of the elbow when the patient grasps the hand placement. So again, two point, three point, and four point crutch walking. A two point, the patient is standing. Um, let's just go ahead and use the left foot as our first movement. So the patient would move the left foot and then the right crutch. So there's two points on the floor at all times, and we're making that move with the left foot, right crutch, and then we're going to move the right foot, left crutch. So that is an easy two-point uh, crutch walking technique. Uh, Four-point is basically for support. You would move the left foot forward, then advance the right crutch, then the right foot forward and advance the left crutch. There's always four points on the ground at all time. Uh, three point is that you would move both crutches with the injured foot forward and then place the weight on both crutches and then you would swing through with that good leg forward. As a quick review, your patient will always go upstairs with the good leg first, and when they are coming downstairs, they will move with the bad or injured leg first. So up with the good and down with the bad. Okay, we're gonna cover uh, meniscus injuries.
Remember that meniscus injuries, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is an ACL tear. So a meniscus injury can occur alongside an additional ligament tear, but it can also occur alone. So in your um, textbook it does talk about um, acute injuries occur on average in about 61 out of 100,000 people. Um, I'm a visual person so I like to include a lot of little pictures in um, my presentation so your textbook does talk about the C shape and U shape of the medial and lateral meniscus so I've given you an image here so you can actually visualize that and then you can also see in this image where this um, ACL or anterior cruciate ligament comes into play. Um, Meniscus tears frequently occur, like I said before, with an ACL tear. It can be wear and tear as well. Uh, medical diagnosis is determined using the McMurray. And what they are going to do uh, in performing McMurray's is they're going to rotate the lower leg and they're listening for a click. Um, that's going to provide evidence that they have that meniscus issues. Um, the other ways to determine they have a meniscus injury is to do a x-ray and then an MRI. Um, smaller tears can often heal. However, if it is a larger tear when you're getting into this connective tissue, whether it be the meniscus or a ligament or tendon, it has to be repaired that it will not heal on its own if it is a um, <clears throat> larger injury. So the next part in your textbook does talk about uh, the surgical management and it's usually performed through a scope uh, repair and um, this patient is usually sent home same day. Uh, they have a follow-up appointment with physical therapy in a couple days and then they're put on a physical therapy uh, plan in conjunction with the surgeon and usually your textbook says anywhere from six to eight weeks they can uh, go through physical therapy however uh, from a nursing standpoint while they're in the hospital with us we want to again look at our physical assessment uh, pre and post-op normal post-operative care which we discussed earlier in the lecture uh, with assessing for hemorrhage, neuro checks, vital signs, dressing, drainage, and monitoring and managing their post-operative pain. Can apply ice that will help with the swelling and the discomfort. And we want to elevate the extremity to also help with um, swelling. On this slide we're going to talk about ACL injuries or anterior cruciate ligament and the whole purpose of the ACL is to stabilize the knee. So you can see in the image here where the ACL actually crisscrosses um, from the femur and attaches to the tibia. So if I were the patient and all I was interested in is walking frontward and backward I would be fine but if I want to do any kind of um, side to side movement then um, my knee would buckle or give out. Therefore, um, that's one of the things when a patient has an injury for an ACL, they look at their uh, mobility, their activity level, how, about, how bad the tear is, and determine what kind of treatment options uh, would be good for that particular patient. So, quick review, um, ACL, Tears or injuries usually affect greater than 100,000 patients a year. Two main reasons for ACL tear would be a hyperextension of the knee or pivoting injury. And I can't tell you uh, how many times I watch sports, either basketball or football, and somebody's toted off the field or they actually walk off the field. Um, and then later on, it's determined that they have an ACL injury. So um, that pivoting or hyperextension of the knee is that cause. 
<clears throat> diagnosing an ACL injury is quite simple. Um, the orthopedic provider would just do a simple lack, Lackman's test, and that is where they place one hand on the femur and one on the tibia. The knee is flexed, and they do um, a shift in motion to determine any flexibility or uh, movement of that knee that is greater than it should be. If it is positive or has that um, additional movement, they know that the patient has an ACL injury. They also can order an MRI to look at those soft tissue injuries um, and determine what things are looking like in the joint. Uh, somebody who has an ACL tear may have that popping sound and have immediate pain and swelling. Immediately post-injury, want to uh, manage with rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevate. And then that patient usually sees a primary provider or goes directly to the orthopedic surgeon. They determine that they have the injury by performing that Lackman's test and then they could potentially follow up with an MRI. However, CAT scan, um, however, X-ray is not going to show any soft tissue, but it may show some other kind of fractures that might have occurred during the time of the injury. So when we're getting down to a decision by the medical provider whether surgery uh, should be performed or not, um, age is one of the factors. Obviously younger patients usually have surgery whereas an older patient may not want or need surgery based on their activity level. There's different types of reconstruction. That most of them are done through scope and they may have a um, graft that is done from the hamstring of the patient or they may use a cadaver graft. This patient is the same day surgical patient so basic post-operative vitals and assessments that we've already discussed from previous surgeries, neurovascular assessments, dressing, drainage would be important. This patient is discharged usually with a um, brace that immobilizes the knee. On the third post-op day, the patient will be seen in physical therapy and then therapy, <clears throat> usually for six weeks, will be performed. Takes a full six months of rehab to obtain optimal knee function. So after the initial six weeks of physical therapy, that patient will then have a special brace made and placed so that when they are interacting with some type of activity, they will at first use the brace at all times and then move to using the brace for those activities. The patient has to be cleared by the provider in order to return to like sports. So uh, let me kind of bring this picture home to you in a quick little story. Uh, when my son was in the eighth grade, very active. <clears throat> he never stayed inside, always out playing uh, sports of some kind or outside running around in the neighborhood. So they were playing some tackle football in the front yard. He ran um, to catch the ball, fell off a curb, and twisting motion of the knee tore his ACL. So what I talked about, immediate swelling 
um, and that popping noise, that's exactly what happened. Um, his knee swelled up probably the size of a, um, maybe a small, small soccer ball. And um, he said, I heard it pop. And um, so I did the good thing that an orthopedic nurse would do. And we riced it. And um, then I put him on some crutches and said, okay, go off to school. Should be good. Probably just sprained it and strained it. So two days later when he still had the swelling and um, was having difficulty uh, with pain, we saw an orthopedic surgeon. And the surgeon did that Latchman's test, determined that he had an ACL tear and said he needed surgery. Um, I asked if he wanted to do an MRI or anything and he said, no, I know exactly what they need, what he needs and he needs surgery. So I did get a second opinion. They told me the same thing. So we went to the pediatric orthopedic surgeon and had the ACL tear um, fixed. Why I bring this up is we talked about uh, cadaver grafts and um, the patient's own hamstring being used. If it's a pediatric patient, the procedure is going to be slightly different because normally it would just go directly into um, the ends of the bones in an older patient, but when you have a growth plate and growth still going on, they attach that. Um, ligament differently. So in my son's case, uh, the portion of the new graft that goes to the tibia is actually brought down lower beyond the growth plate. Post-op, again, um, home with an immobilizer with a compression wrap underneath the immobilizer continuous ice for the first 24 hours and could be used thereafter for comfort. Appointment was scheduled for physical therapy for day three post-op. In three days, this is what I want to tell you so quickly, um, those muscles can atrophy when they're not being used there was a distinct size difference from his extremity that had the ACL tear because of the mobiliz mobilization for three days, actually just two and a half because we went early for PT, versus um, the extremity that had the full range of motion. And it took him almost a year to build back up that muscle. So um, physical therapy, crutch use and um, then braced after six weeks. So for us as the nurse, it's going to be a very short period of care and we would want to follow up with any kind of um, assessment or um, shock, teaching, analgesics, neuro checks, vital signs, all those things post-operatively. So a patient who has a rotator cuff, on the previous slide there was an image of the actual shoulder and it ties to this first statement listed on this slide that the rotator cuff is actually made up of <clears throat> not just one but of multiple um, mus muscles as well as tendons that connect that humerus, clavicle, and scapula all together. Um, so the other thing I did want to mention to you is that with the ACL or a rotator cuff or any other ligaments um, and tendons, there can be a partial versus a full uh, tear. and partial tears are actually usually more painful than a full tear, but 
whether the tear is small and a partial, then healing may just be the option versus if it's a full tear, surgery is absolutely required to fix the injury because uh, connective tissue cannot um, build back and repair itself in that way and it has to be surgically repaired. So um, again, the rotator cuff is made up of multiple uh, muscles and tendons to connect all those in the shoulder area, so humerus, clavicle, scapula. Um, how it's determined that the patient has a rotator cuff is by doing the drop arm test, uh, very similar to that uh, Latchman's test. Um, they have trouble lifting or stretching the arm out towards the side and they will actually, that arm will drift back down because they have trouble abducting um, the arm. So that's the drop arm test. Um, if they attempt to um, stretch their arm above their head, uh, they will have pain. Usually the pain on a rotator cuff is greater at night than during the morning and they're unable to lay on the affected side due to um, discomfort. Diagnosed again, they may start out with an x-ray that's going to look at um, structure. However, MRI is going to look at soft tissue injury. NSAIDs, exercise, steroid injections, and surgery. We'll discuss those in a little bit more depth, but that's usually the progression of uh, treatment for a rotator cuff. If they don't, if the patient does not respond to conservative treatment, then they will move to um, <clears throat> surgical repair. Now, when we're talking about um, rotator cuff injuries, when they do surgery, it is strict uh, mobility restrictions for this patient for six months. And it is not only prescribed by the provider, but physical therapy. So when that patient comes back from surgery and they have an abduction pillow with a splint, and they usually have had a nerve block placed in the shoulder, so they're not going to be that uncomfortable to begin with because that will eventually wear off and they'll have some greater discomfort later. So they have the nerve block, they have the ice, um, continuous ice flush to the area, and then they have a abduction pillow with this sling and swath on, so it's a very um, specific sling and swath for um, the shoulder. That position is going to remain abducted until physical therapy works with them at a later time. The only movement at that particular time the patient should be doing is finger movement um, and we're going to be doing our neuro checks on the patient so asking for movement of the finger is fine. You do not want to do anything in addition to that with this patient. Um, recovery, full function, functional recovery is usually about six months. This goes for a total shoulder as well. So um, they will start off if the injury occurs, uh, treating with NSAIDs, they'll move to physical therapy exercises. Um, steroid injections may also be administered, but they would only give those steroid injections about every um, couple months due to the fact that steroids actually will break down the connective tissue within the joint so they don't like doing more than two or three of those injections and then obviously surgery is going to be the last um, management that they will use so again, it's usually done through a scope, but it can be done in a mini or a open incision. Nursing care is usually very short term because they too will be discharged home as a um, short stay 
patient. So education and follow up with their surgeon as far as, and as far as following PT uh, therapy is going to be very important. And then two, this is long term, six months rehab for full recovery. The nursing interventions that are going to be implemented prior to the patient having the amputation, we're going to want to manage that patient's pain and help decrease their anxiety level. As nurses, it's going to be important that we are there for support as the patient grieves the impending loss of whatever the limb or appendage is. And we also have to take into account that that patient may be angry or become depressed related to that potential loss or if it's a traumatic loss once they have the surgery and um, the amputation has occurred. Uh, nursing wants to handle the limbs gently as well as elevate the swollen limb. We want to explain any preoperative orders as well as preps for surgery and also explain to the patient what they may see being performed as far as care goes postoperatively. Like when we come in um, from the nursing standpoint and do vitals, why are we doing those vitals? Why are we asking that patient to turn, cough, deep, breathe? Or why are we positioning the patient in a certain way? Uh, postoperative, we're going to manage their pain with um, opioid pain medications. Uh, we also are going to uh, make sure that they understand uh, what phantom pain is. And phantom pain is something that actually can last anywhere from uh, months to years to potentially the remainder of the patient's life. This is where the nerves continue to send messages to the brain that um, that extremity or appendage is pain, has pain. Uh, we're going to monitor uh, vital signs. We're going to assess for any changes that might reflect hemorrhage, such as hypotension. Uh, we are evaluating then for shock. We're assessing the dressing and drainage on that dressing. What color is the drainage? How much? And all along, we're performing our neurological assessments. The patient's going to return from surgery wearing a compression wrap, and that's going to help with decreasing the bleeding. Another big part of postoperative care that is going to be provided is to prevent contractures. So with the elevation of the residual limb, if we elevate the residual limb continuously on pillows, we can actually cause those flexor muscles to um, contract. So what's going to be important post-surgery is usually about 24 to 48 hours. Instead of placing the residual limb on a pillow, we're just going to elevate the foot of the bed. The other thing that will be um, ordered for the patient postoperatively and nursing is a part of this uh, rehab afterwards is to uh, make sure that the patient is performing their exercises that physical therapy has um, set forth and that the patient is being placed in the prone position at least twice a day and that's going to help with stretching out that flexor muscle so that those contractures don't happen. So um, previously I said that the patient returns with that compression wrap um, postoperatively, and then that's gonna be moved to either an elastic wrap, such as an ACE wrap, or you might see a compression sock being placed on the patient's uh, residual limb in order to shrink and mold that residual limb so that prosthetics can be fitted. Some patients do return postoperatively as early as immediately with a prosthetic device. Uh, usually 
there's some time period where those elastic wraps and socks uh, shrink and mold. And then within a few weeks, um, that patient is begin the fitting process for prosthetics. I do want to make sure that you all remember that when a patient has an amputation, this also involves trauma to the bone. So please remember to watch for pulmonary embolism um, in your patients. So when you're assessing, you're always looking for shortness of breath, any changes of O2 uh, saturation, and uh, complaints of shortness of breath. And um, obviously, a little bit later signs would be that petechiae on the upper upper body torso on the chest. Before I cover some safety uh, measures regarding amputations, I do want to review over the different abbreviations you might see in a patient's chart related to an amputation. So if a patient has a below the knee amputation, you're going to see that abbreviated as a BKA. If it's an above the knee amputation, you will see AKA as the abbreviation. Um, below the elbow would be a BEA and above the elbow would be an AEA. Um, there's also something called a disarticulation, and that is where the amputation occurs through the joint. So that can occur with the knee, the hip, an ankle, or a partial foot amputation. So uh, when we're talking about um, safety post-amputation with our patients, um, remember this is a team of um, healthcare members that work with the rehab for this patient. Um, and nursing is a very important part of that. And they work hand in hand with physical therapy as well as the physicians. But um, nursing, we would want to um, monitor the patient's coordination, their mobility, their strength. And always remember that the higher the amputation, the greater energy that's required for ambulation and the higher the amputation, um, we also have to recognize that there's an increase in mortality and also a decreased rehab potential. So as far as post-operative um, nursing interventions, I mentioned earlier that vital signs were very important as they are going to be that baseline to determine, let us know if um, there are issues with bleeding as far as residual um, limb care, we want to assess that dressing. It may need to be reinforced. I mentioned a couple exercises. Uh, we don't want to elevate on a pillow, but we can elevate the foot of the bed to decrease that uh, flexor muscle contraction. The other ways to prevent the contraction is to make sure that patient lies prone at least twice a day and that patient can also be placed on a firm mattress. Um, to help shrink and shape that residual limb prior to the prosthesis being applied, we want to avoid circular turns. Remember, we're going to use that um, that adhesive, not adhesive, we're going to use that uh, compression wrap. So with that ACE wrap, we want to make sure that we um, avoid circular turns because that is going to interfere with blood flow. Uh, what you will see done most commonly is going to be the figure eight wrap using those compression um, ACE bandages. So rehabilitation depends upon the age of the patient, the type of amputation, the condition of the residual limb, the physical status of the patient, uh, the condition of the remaining limb, uh, their motor coordination, motivation, acceptance, and cooperation of the patient, uh, 
And we also have to provide as a rehab team a realistic expectation and period that will be allotted for training during this rehab process. So the rehab team is not only made up of nurses, but physicians and physical therapists as well. Um, nursing needs to make sure not to exceed the physician's recommendations regarding weight bearing and joint flexion. Um, also, um, nurses and care team members need to make sure not to apply any kind of ointments or creams to the incision site unless it's approved by the provider. Okay, remember that the nurse is a small part of the rehab team that works with the patient with an amputation, uh, but the nurse may actually be responsible for involving that multiple members of the healthcare team in the patient's care and rehab and coordinating their activities. So following an amputation, uh, the patient may need uh, many services um, social services to help with rehab and financial arrangements, um, obviously physical therapy to teach with ambulation techniques or to provide um, other therapies such as heat or massage, occupational therapists to assist with the patient developing um, adaptive techniques to deal with the loss of the limb, uh, prosthetics, home health services for nursing care, so, such as um, assessments and wound care. And we, as nurses, need to remember that uh, patients will need information regarding support group services to assist them in adapting to uh, body image change and effects of amputations on ADLs. Um, as far as home care goes, we wanna make sure that um, we are preparing the uh, amputee for home care, um, including a careful assessment of the patient, the family, uh, support services, and the home for possible barriers for the patient's safe, safety and independence. Um, we want to make sure that um, we inquire about arrangements for home care activities and ADLs. We want to assess the patient's home environment for possible safety hazards and barriers for ambulation. Um, those include scatter rugs, stairs. Um, Want to look for uh, the presence of grab bars to help facilitate in toileting and bathing and assess for um, simple things like uh, water sources, clean water and other needs for wound care that will be required we we'll to encourage the patient to resume physical activities as soon as possible. This helps improve the patient's overall health and well-being, as well as the patient's self-esteem. Um, any household modifications to promote independence, uh, such as those grab bars mentioned earlier in the bathroom, um, single-handed controls for water flow and temperature, um, shower heads that can be uh, handheld, shower chairs, uh, nursing needs to think about those as we're managing that team and, and prepping that patient for discharge uh, from rehab. Okay, in regards to amputations, I do want to let you know that um, an amputation we used to call it a stump, now it's called a residual limb, so I'm going to do my best to um, use that terminology. I do want to draw your attention to page 1186 in your textbook. It does talk about care for limb reattachment, that what someone should do with the body part or the <clears throat> amputation prior to arriving in the ER. Um, make sure that it is rinsed off and padded softly, dry. 
So isotonic solution, whether it be normal saline or lactated ringers, obviously if we don't have those available, it would be just water and then um, patted dry, loosely wrapped in gauze or a towel placed in a plastic bag and then the bag placed in an ice and water solution. Um, don't ever want to have direct contact with um, ice because it will cause tissue damage and therefore decrease the risk <clears throat> or decrease the success of reattachment. Remember that an amputation can be a planned surgery um, due to uh, peripheral vascular disease or diabetes mellitus or it can be a result of a traumatic injury. Either one, you have to expect that the patient will grieve the loss of whatever is being removed. So um, grieve the loss of the, the limb. Alright, so the first area that I have on the slide is what are some different reasons why someone may have a amputation. So it can be a long list, but just briefly, it could be related to a tumor, infection of the bone or tissue, so osteomyelitis, trauma, obviously is highest among young men. It's the second reason why someone may have an amputation. Peripheral vascular disease is the major reason, and this is why we really want to encourage these patients to monitor their blood pressure, keep their blood pressure controlled, decrease smoking, manage their diabetes and cholesterol because we're trying to prevent this PVD and in the long run uh, amputations. So that's 82% of the reasons why uh, someone may get an amputation. Thermal injuries, a deformity of the limb, and um, life-threatening problems like a thrombi or an infection. Um, I do want to add the list to the list of combat related trauma. I've listed several nursing diagnoses that the nurse may be able to choose from while working with a patient with an amputation. During this recording, we will discuss acute pain. However, there's a plan for an activity that will focus on these other nursing diagnoses as well as the plan of care for a patient with an amputation. So for our first diagnosis listed here, acute pain, we must remember that the pain can come from the surgical procedure itself or be com compounded by muscle spasms, swelling, and phantom limb pain. Pharmacological measures are going to be very important for controlling the patient's acute pain. So to set a goal, we want it to be measurable. So our goal might be that the patient would report that the pain level is controlled to a level of 3 out of 10 within one hour of interventions. And then our interventions would then tie back to accomplishing that goal. So to begin, we would want to ask the patient at least every three to four hours to rate their pain on a scale of zero to 10. And then we may administer uh, pain medications as prescribed. So let's say our patient has Dilaudid, two milligrams IV every three to four hours as needed for pain. So we would administer that and then we would reassess that patient's pain level within one hour to determine if they've met that goal. There are some other interventions that we could do in order to accomplish um, a reduction of pain. We could reposition the patient every two hours, especially turning them on their abdomen or prone twice a day. We can um, Unless it's contraindicated, we could elevate the residual limb on a pillow for at least the first 24, if not 48 hours. After that, we would need to elevate the foot of the bed. This would help promote venous return and decrease swelling, which would therefore decrease the pain. 
Um, along with pharmacological methods, we can encourage the patient to deep breathe and use relaxation exercises. Um, this would increase the effectiveness of the analgesics and modify the pain experience. Carpal tunnel syndrome is the compression of the medial nerve. In the bottom left hand picture you can see a picture of that and what I want to bring your focus to is an actual picture of the carpal tunnel which is uh, where the ligament and bones are and what happens is there's compression and pressure on the nerve that runs through that tunnel, so the medial nerve. Um, the patient experiences weakness in their thumb, burning pain, clumsiness of fine motor skills, and they often have numbness and tingling at night. Um, if the patient shakes their hands, this will temporarily relieve the, um, the pain or the numbness that occurs. So there are two tests that are performed. Um, the Fallon sign, which I've given you a picture of here, there's a 90 degree flexion, and what happens is that uh, tingling occurs, so that's considered a positive uh, Fallon sign. The um, tinnels is where they tap over a medial, the medial nerve and numbness occurs. So in your textbook, um, it does talk about different types of management that you will see these patients undergoing. So ultrasound therapy, NSAIDs, steroid injections, night splinting is actually very effective for carpal tunnel along with NSAID use and Tylenol here listed. However, um, surgical management um, may get to that point with the patient. So it is a um, carpal tunnel release. It's a local anesthetic, um, very easy procedure, does leave an incision um, on the wrist. And again, it is a local anesthetic. You can um, take a look at under teaching, work and activity modifications. Um, they're gonna want to splint and stop the activity responsible for carpal tunnel or modify the activity however that they can. Um, take for instance who is a hairdresser. They're at high risk for carpal tunnel because of the repetitive behaviors. Uh, someone that works at a computer and does typing, you have the ergonomic um, keyboards as well as the mouse pads that will help prevent uh, carpal tunnel. Okay, on the next two slides, I'm going to cover medications. I myself have gone to the drug book that you guys have and looked up this information, but you must do the same thing. That's the way you're going to learn the details of these medications. So, obviously, ibuprofen is something that most of us take. Um, it can be given PO or IV. It inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis. Obviously, we know it's a non-opioid analgesic but we need to give it with caution with our geriatric and OB patients. We want to watch for GI side effects and bleeding tendencies. So again, um, at the end here, I'm saying take him with a full glass of water and remain upright to decrease GI upset. Um, it is best to take in with just water. However, if GI upset occurs, you can take it with food or milk to decrease that GI upset. Um, assess for GI bleed, monitor their pain levels, and watch their kidney and liver functions with this medication. Naproxen, that example of naproxen is um, Aleve. That's the one I think we're most familiar with. So, um, naproxen, sorry, Aleve, it inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis as well as Motrin, it's PO, again, used cautiously in geriatric and OB patients, and we want to watch for GI side effects as well as bleeding and liver issues such as hepatitis, anywhere from 250 to 500 milligrams twice a day instead of four times a day so that makes it easier for patients. Assess for GI bleed, monitor their pain, and monitor kidney and liver functions and um, 
potassium levels. Take with a full glass of water um, to minimize GI upset. Again, same as with Motrin, can be taken with food or milk to decrease that irritation. Here is something different. Patients who have asthma are at risk for developing hypersensitivity, so um, be very mindful of that when giving naproxen or leave. Um, don't want to take antacid with the medication, and then it does have a photosensitivity response, so um, the patients would want to make sure that they are covered in sunlight with either um, long sleeve or, or don't go out in the sun for um, periods of time because they can have a, um, a severe sunburn. Okay, so um, next, diazepam or Valium. It can be given PO, IM, or IV. It decreases the CNS probability for potentiation, potentiating GABA, um, which is a neurotransmitter, and it causes muscle skeletal relaxation and it also is an anti-convulsive um, has those anti-convulsant properties it is rapidly absorbed in the GI tract and I do want to bring your attention to the fact that we need to monitor blood pressure pulse respiration rate and in giving IV we need to assess the IV site um, this medication can lead to dependence it causes drowsiness, so we want to monitor um, our patient for any changes in vital signs and assess for safety related to falls. Um, we want to monitor liver and renal functions as well as our, H, our complete blood count. Administer IV slowly over one minute, and you can see here I've listed if you give it too quickly, it can actually um, cause some difficulty breathing as well as drop of blood pressure and a pulse. Um, so you don't want to take your Valium with um, an alcohol intake. Uh, so no other CNS depressants while um, you're taking the Valium. Flexoril, it is, um, works with the muscle activity at the level of the brain stem, so it reduces muscle spasm. Uh, watch for dizziness, drowsiness, dry mouth, constipation, so safety is the issue, both on Valium and Flexoril. That would be drowsiness, don't drive heavy equipment. Um, Flexoril is available at 10 milligram tablet. Three times a day is a normal dose. However, it is available in five milligram tablet. Um, I took this medication one time for the largest um, muscle um, not in my back that I had and I took a five, 10 milligram best nap I ever took in my life I now take 5 milligrams if I should ever have to have uh, Flexoril don't want to take it with any other CNS depressant avoid driving and other activities that require alertness so they do not want uh, someone to take Flexoril on a long term basis so um, up to two weeks. Our last two medications are Toradol and Mobic. You guys are probably very familiar with Toradol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory non-opioid medication and inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis. Again, cardiac and GI patients we want to use cautiously in um, does have CNS and GI side effects monitor uh, renal function can be given PO and I've given you some parameters here if less than 60 years of age 20 milligrams initially followed by 10 milligrams every four to six hours as needed adults over the age of 65 is 10 milligrams every four to six hours uh, you can take a look over the IM and IV dosages. We need to assess for uh, pain levels, liver, kidney function, and bleeding time. So watch your lab values. And then, you know, monitor this IV at least 15 seconds or beyond. Um, can be given with normal saline, D5W, or lactated ringers. 
Mobic is just a um, more like a muscle relaxant. It is um, a prostaglandin inhibitor uh, regarding the synthesis, GI and liver side effects. It's PO seven and a half milligrams daily up to 15 milligrams and hypersensitivity for those who have asthma. Monitor liver and kidney functions. Take with a full glass of water and remain upright for at least 15 to 30 minutes to decrease the GI effects. Pain medications um, as far as morphine versus Demerol. Obviously, uh, morphine is going to be the drug of choice over Demerol and we need to monitor our geriatric patients. You know, we have a little old lady who comes in with a fractured hip and we're medicating her with opioid medications for relief of pain. However, we have to remember the half-life of the medication and how that will just compound in the patient. So before long, this patient is um, totally changed in their level of consciousness and they are um, completely um, confused and not themselves. You have to go back and look at their medications to see what they're on because it very well can be these pain medications that we're giving these patients while they have this muscle skeletal trauma issues. Hi, this is Ms. Orinder. I'm going to be recording Chapter 54, Coordinating Care of Patients with Muscle Skeletal Trauma. During my acute care uh, nursing career, I did work on an orthopedic unit. This is a part of nursing that I absolutely love. So I do try to share stories to help this information come across a little bit better for you. So we're going to jump right in and I hope you enjoy the lecture.